Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are across this wonderful uh, country from coast to coast to coast. Welcome teachers and students. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to day four of Truth and Reconciliation Week. It is, of course, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And uh, I am Andre Gracie. I am part of the Reconciliation Week team. And it is uh, my great pleasure to welcome someone I met, I guess, about 10 years ago uh, during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings in Halifax. And it felt like no time had passed and we were good friends again uh, today. Uh, I'm a uh, great honor to welcome Christy Jordan Fenton, uh, an award-winning author of the wonderful book, Fatty Legs and three other children's books, as well as she is a curriculum designer, a facilitator and co-director of the Cultural Learning and Innovation Circle. Uh, Christy is a member of the Yellow Thunder ceremonial family of the Kainai Blackfoot. And we are pleased to welcome you to this literature session, Saving the Spirit, the Heroism of Margaret Ulman Kokiak, Fenton of Fatty Legs. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. Um, well, good morning. Oki Jahanache Tanzi Buju Hanawit Pit. Thanks for joining me this morning um, so that I can share with you the story of Margaret uh, Pokiak Fenton. If I could get my um, slides queued, I have brought some visuals this morning that I would like to share with you. If any of you, especially young um, listeners, feel upset at any point, um, in this talk, do take care of yourselves and um, be sure to um, take some water or go for a walk or whatever it, it is you need to do. So we want to care for our spirits as well. So I'm just going to wait for, oh, here we go. Um, visuals to be shared. Here we are. Okay, so um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where um, we're joining from, I'm going to talk to you about the books that I worked on with Margaret Uluman Pokiak Fenton. So Margaret um, was a beautiful Inavalik woman who is also the grandmother of my children. I am coming to you today from the territory of the Doneza, but Margaret came from the territory of the Inavaluit. Now, um, my children being Margaret's grandchildren, are in Evaluate themselves. And because we live in the territory of the Danaiza, I didn't have any way to teach them what it meant to be in Evaluate. So maybe some of you tuning in today um, have parents or grandparents, or maybe even you come from China or India or Russia, and how you would know what it means to be Chinese or Indian or Russian is you would go to your grandparents and ask them for stories to know about that. So that's what I did. I went to Margaret and I bugged her for stories all the time um, about growing up up north. So she started telling me stories about traveling um, by dog sled, about hunting wolves and polar bears. She had the most amazing stories. So in a moment, I'm gonna tell you the story um, that she told me one day that led to all of these books. But first I want to um, show you some pictures of this beautiful woman that we're talking about today. So the smallest picture is, uh, or sorry, the, the top picture of when she's the smallest, the youngest, um, that was Margaret when she was just a little girl. This was a, a little bit before she went to residential school, but you can see um, how really cute she was. Then there is an illustration that was done by Lizamini Holmes of Margaret as a um, character in a book, real person and a character. The next photo is one of my favorite photos of her. It was taken when she was 16. Uh, the outfit she's wearing was somewhat traditional, but also modern for the time. And she would have spent weeks and weeks and weeks um, beading and embroidering the outfit by hand. And it showed her um, walking with a foot in both worlds, um, both traditional and um, also a bit modern. And then at the bottom photo um, is the beautiful Margaret who passed um, this last April at the age of 84. So Margaret and I lived right next door to each other on a farm um, out in the middle of nowhere, half an hour out of town. 
And we used to drive together. Margaret didn't drive, so I would drive her to town. And on the way, she would tell me all those great stories. One day, she told me a really different story. So we were driving to town, and she said, they used to call me Fatty Legs. She went on to tell me um, a secret she kept for 65 years. So she told me about when she was just eight years old. She wanted nothing more in the world than to learn how to read. But the only way she could do that was to go far away to the residential school. Once she got there, she got stuck there for two years. That has to be the world's longest school day. And when she was there, one of her teachers, this horrible nun, um, picked on her all the time. And she gave her these bright red stockings to wear. So everybody teased her and they laughed at her because nobody else was wearing stockings like that. And they called her fatty legs. Then she told me how she got rid of those stockings. And that was the secret she kept for 65 years. So I was the first person who got to find out what she did with those stockings. Immediately, I wanted to tell her story. I said, oh, Margaret, this is a great story. I really want to write this story. And she said, no. She said um, later on that the reason she said no is she didn't want her grandchildren to know she had been naughty at one time. But actually, I think what she did was so heroic and brave. I was raised by a residential school survivor. My stepfather was Cree Métis. And I knew that residential school had really affected him even as an adult though he didn't really talk about it. I knew a lot of people who went to residential schools um, when I was growing up, a lot of the adults had gone. So when Margaret told me the story, and it was a story of a child who actually went up to the nun, um, I was very excited to tell it. So Margaret was known for being very determined, but so was I. And uh, eventually we ended up with four books. Um, so I'm gonna try and show you on a map where Margaret's from. So if you wanna try and um, locate uh, yourself on the map. Uh, so let's say if you were in Edmonton, that would be about a seven hour drive from Vancouver. It could be anywhere from 16 to 20 hours to get to the house. And from that house, so that's the territory of the Danaiza, also known as Fort St. John. And that's where Margaret and I lived. She moved there uh, in the 1960s. She met a cowboy and became a cowgirl. But that's a totally different story. So if you drove from that house for three and a half days without sleeping, you would end up just so if you drove straight to the ocean, but not quite to the ocean, um, you would end up in Inuvik. In Inuvik, you would get on a plane for two and a half hours to end up where the mittens are. Where the mittens are is Banks Island, and that is where Margaret was originally from. I like to tease that if she was living any further north, she would have been living with Santa Claus. To go to the school, she had to cross the Arctic Ocean, come up the river, and where the books are, that was a clavic, that's where she went to residential school. It doesn't look like it was a really long ways from the island um, she came from, but it was. So I would encourage teachers as an exercise you can do with your class, Google how far it is from Banks Island to a clavic, and then locate where you are on the map and find some place that is a similar distance. This is what it looks like where Margaret came from. There were no trees and the ocean in front would freeze for about 10 months of the year when she was young. They traveled by boat. So once that ocean froze, they were landlocked. They weren't going anywhere. And they lived in frame tents. The reason that they did that is they were semi-nomadic. So every once in a while, they would um, pack up their whole community and they'd move somewhere else for better hunting and trapping and fishing. Um, this is a picture of a frame tent. So what they would do is they would put snow and ice around it to keep it really nice and warm inside and insulated and they'd have a stove inside. They're actually a very comfortable way of living. The largest child you see here is Margaret. This was taken a little bit after she came back from residential school. You can see how really nice and warm she's dressed underneath that top layer of her attic look or also known as a Mother Hubbard parka would be a heavy layer of caribou fur. And if you don't know what a caribou is, it's like a wild reindeer. So they're in the Arctic, it's super cold out, it's the middle of winter, and you can see how really warm and comfortable those children look. That's because the time Margaret was born, she had thousands and thousands of years of ancestral knowledge to be able to be very comfortable in her environment. 
What ancestral knowledge means is that um, every set of grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, great 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 grandparents, all the way back thousands of years, every set of grandparents came up with a better and a better and a better way to live where they were at. So by the time she was born, they knew exactly how to be comfortable there. But then the outsiders came from Europe. The outsiders wanted to assimilate or make the children like Europeans so badly, they dressed them like they were in Europe. But the outsiders' ancestral knowledge or grandparents came from Europe, very different environment. They dressed the children like they were in Paris or London, but they weren't, they were where the ocean freezes. So who do you think knew better on how the children should dress? The people who were very brand new to the area or the people who had been there for thousands and thousands of years. I think we could all agree this is much better way to dress in the winter time. This is where Margaret went to school, but this is not a picture of the school. This is a picture of the hospital. Um, for any of you who have red fatty legs, the largest nun in the middle was Sister McQuillan. So she was a real person. This picture was taken a little bit before Margaret went to the school. But that hospital there, so for those of you going to school, you probably just go to school and you worry about learning. The school that Margaret went to, they had to work in the hospital as well. Even when there was pandemics and um, outbreaks of illness, they would make the little children work in the hospital. What the purpose of residential schools was, and a lot of them were called industrial schools, and industrial schools where you learn to be a worker. So the purpose of residential schools was to teach children to do jobs nobody else wanted to do. When they were working in the hospital, they weren't learning to be nurses or to be um, doctors. They were cleaning up garbages and bedpans and taking meals to the sick. But one of Margaret's sisters became the first registered in a Volok, um, nurse. So she became a nurse anyways. So just behind here, it's really hard to see. There are some trees. Margaret was very terrified of the trees because she didn't grow up with them. The big fun thing they would do is they would go picking berries. Berry picking is a lot of fun. And because they were never fed enough food at the schools, it was a very exciting thing for them to be able to go and try and pick the berries fast and get them in your mouth as quickly as you could. But the nuns used to scare the children and ruin it for them. They would tell them stories of children who went missing in the woods and monsters waiting to get them. And um, it was pretty, pretty awful. So um, they would be quite scared. So Margaret's story takes place at the same time as World War II. Um, she was, it wasn't at the war, but at the same time. But so we think of residential schools ending a long, long time ago, but residential schools ended a year after I graduated high school. And that would be 1996. I'm probably around the same age as your parents, probably younger than most of your grandparents. What that means is yes, there are people in your community who went to residential school or have a parent who went to residential school. So when Margaret was going to school, she got to go back to school shopping. Um, this is where she has a connection with um, Phyllis's story. So her mom took her shopping and bought her these beautiful gray stockings. Margaret was so excited. There was something like a woman would wear and very grown up and um, she couldn't wait to wear them. Her mom said, no, you gotta wait till you get to school to put them on. And she bought her some toiletries, some things for her to keep clean at the school. So Margaret gets to the school. They line all the girls up in the morning to get ready. Margaret didn't speak or understand English. So she just sort of followed what everybody else was doing and um, they were getting out the toothbrushes and their tubes of paste. So she got out hers, she put it on her toothbrush, stuck it in her mouth and she said it tasted horrible. It wasn't toothpaste, it was shaving cream. So everybody laughed and made fun of her mom and it made her feel really bad about her mom, like her mom was stupid, but her mom wasn't stupid. Her mom was an Inavalok woman who spoke Inavaluktan and lived in Inavaluit territory. She spoke the same language that had been spoken there for thousands of years. She lived in the, her own country, the Inavaluit country. And just like there was a Haudenosaunee country, the Anishinaabe country, the Blackfoot, the Cree, 
Canada came and set itself on top of all of those nations. And all of a sudden, everybody had to speak or understand English or French. So it's hard to understand how Margaret's father would let her go to the school. But because all of a sudden, everybody was having to speak or understand English, um, that's why she was sent. Most children were forced to go to the schools, but some parents did send their children because they understood how important it was for them to be able to um, deal with this new country that they were living in. At the school, Margaret's biggest bully was her teacher. Um, in, in the story, she was called the Raven. She had a name, but Margaret didn't want to use it because Margaret said, this isn't her story. And she didn't want the woman to be remembered. And I learned a lot from Margaret about that, um, about making it Margaret's story and not about um, the bad things that were done. So in Margaret's time, um, she couldn't report that she was being bullied. She couldn't go to the school principal because everybody at the school was mostly just as bad. And if they weren't, they were like, well, it's just how it is. She couldn't go to the police. The police made a lot of the children go to the school. She couldn't just call her parents. This is the time of, this is World War II in the high Arctic. There was no, um, there's no Snapchat, no Discord, no email. She couldn't make a TikTok about how bad her school was. Even if she could have got a hold of her parents, they couldn't come and get her. The ocean was frozen. If they had been able to come get her, she wouldn't have been allowed to leave. So as you learn about the stories of children who went to residential school, I would love to ask you to always look for how these children saved themselves. All the children could do was be very, very strong in their hearts and their spirits and be very, very clever. And children who were raised in a traditional way had very strong spirits and they were incredibly clever, very smart. It's what I loved about Margaret's story, um, that she wouldn't let her spirit be worn down and that she was so smart in getting rid of her stockings. Her first day of school didn't turn out anything like she thought it would. Um, she expected she was gonna go to school and the nuns were gonna be so nice to her and she'd learn to read right away and go home. She had no idea she'd be stuck there for two years. Also, children raised traditionally did not know what it meant for adults to just be mean to them. Children raised traditionally weren't punished. They would be sat down with their parents or their grandparents, and they would, it would be explained to them why what they did was wrong, how it affected other people, and they would be asked how they could make it right. But that was not where Margaret was going to school. Margaret's traditional name was Uliman. So when an ulimon is, is the stone that you would sharpen an ulu knife with. And um, what that would say about Margaret was she was very strong, very determined. She couldn't be worn down. She wasn't allowed to use that name at the school, but she knew that's who I am. I'm not going to be worn down. At the school, she had her hair cut like um, most schools. There was a number of reasons, um, some of them having to do with traditions and um, other reasons had to do with, um, so like taking away their spiritual traditions, other reasons had to do with, you can see here how all these girls look like clones, it was taking away their individuality, who they were as people. Liz Amini Holmes, who painted um, this, uh, this is the book cover for Fatty Legs, said she didn't paint the tops of the girls' heads because she wanted to show who they were, what their hopes, what their dreams were. The school, it didn't matter. They wanted to make good little workers. And that was the purpose of the school, not to bring out this brilliance and creativity. It was to make good workers. Um, another reason I've heard a lot about why they cut the hair is that um, because of lice or because Europeans really got it wrong um, when it came to indigenous hygiene. So I'd encourage you to find out what the practices were um, for the people in the territory you live in, but for pretty much every indigenous nation, they might have different practices, but hygiene and keeping clean and keeping your hair clean was part of daily spiritual practice. Indigenous people were very clean. And if you look at this photo here, everybody, or these photos, everyone has their hair in different styles, 
but it's all very clean and immaculate and beautiful. At the same time, in Europe, people were wearing wigs, they were wearing scarves, they were wearing bonnets, they'd keep the hair up and tight because lice was a really big problem at that time. So I'm not talking about religious head coverings, that's totally different, um, but fashion head coverings. People would be very worried about getting lice. Indigenous people lived really um, at peace with the land. If they were stressing the land out, they picked up their community and they moved some, somewhere else. And in Europe at the same time, a lot of people moved into cities very quickly and they didn't make a plan on where to put their garbage. So you can see here, um, these are some places where they just threw the garbage um, out the door. So uh, I don't think that saying that they cut the hair because of um, cleanliness is all that accurate. Now, what happened when they cut the hair, um, just to, to um, brush over it quickly, is for many Indigenous nations, they all have different teachings. The teachings I have um, come from their Lakota teachings um, that have learned through the, the Kainai Blackfoot. Um, the, the length of your hair has to do with your courage, your honour, your strength, and your connection to spirit. And one of the main reasons that you would cut your hair, you don't just cut your hair for fashion, would be because somebody really close to you died and it's letting go of that past part of your life with that person so they can move on to the spirit world. All well, these children were lined up. They couldn't read or understand English and they couldn't ask questions. They weren't allowed and they were all having their hair cut. I think it must have felt very apocalyptic or like the end of the world because they would have thought, is my family okay? Did my mom die? Did my dad die? What about this kid? Did his family die? And this child, and this child, and this child. It would have been really scary until they could find out. Even when they found out their family was okay, it still meant they were letting go of everything from their past life. Um, here's a picture of smudge. So smudge um, is burning herbs or um, where, uh, plants. Or where I live, we burn fungus. And it's for cleansing your spirit. But most smudges have antibacterial properties. And it's also like using hand sanitizer. So, um, so another reason why indigenous people smudge on top of cleansing the spirit is to keep very clean. Here is the boat that Margaret's family traveled by. Um, there would be several families on this boat, very large families. This boat is docked at the Vancouver Maritime Museum. You can see it, it's called the North Star. And they would go once a year to go shopping for everything that they needed once a year. If you didn't get it on that trip, you were gonna have to do without or find it off the land. In the middle here is a picture of Margaret. This is when they would bring in the barge loads of firewood. And because the children lived at the school, when it was time to unload the barges, they could get them up at six in the morning and make them work till 11 o'clock at night. Margaret said um, that they would work them until they just couldn't even lift their arms anymore. And they would do that for a couple of weeks. And here's the wood. It goes several rows back and wraps way around um, those buildings. And if you see in the background, there is a picture of the school she went to. Um, it no longer exists. It washed away into the river and eroded. But that's where she went to school. And here's a picture of two of her sisters in the playroom. This was after Margaret went to school. Um, that floor, she said, um, they didn't have toys like that when she went there. They would have to scrub that floor and clean it all the time, over and over again. But her favorite part of being at school, so she always found something good out of even the bad stuff, was they would put down wax on the floor and they'd get big, thick wool stockings and they'd slip and slide up and down like human bumper cars. And she really loved that. But it was in the day before a Swiffer wet jet. So they were on their hands and knees and scrubbing. The worst chore that Margaret had to do was um, they didn't have proper bathrooms in their school. So they would use out houses. And at nighttime, if they had to go to the bathroom, they went to the bathroom in buckets. So Margaret was told um, she could either go to church in the morning to pray, or she could go empty out the bathroom waste of all of her classmates. And she was very stubborn, very determined. She emptied out the bathroom waste rather than go to church. And here's a picture of the boys at the school. These boys um, in the springtime would be taken out um, to go check the trap lines. Um, kind of a, a very hard and dangerous job. Um, and they would be sent out to make money for the school. They'd come back with muskrats 
and the furs would be sold, but they take the meat and the children would have to eat the meat. Now muskrat is a traditional food for many indigenous nations and there's some great teachings behind eating it. But where Margaret came from, they ate whales, they ate caribou, they ate fish, they didn't eat furry little creatures. So how most of you would feel about eating muskrat is exactly how she felt about it. So after two years at the school, no contact with her parents, wondering if she was ever, ever gonna get to go home. Finally, they said, Margaret, your family's gonna meet you in Tuktoyaktuk, get on the boat. Um, this boat was kind of like a school bus, but it didn't get you in the morning and take you back in the afternoon. It got you at the end of summer and took you home at the beginning of summer. If you lived close enough, Margaret did not live close enough. So her family was gonna meet her at a place that was closer. So she got on the boat. Now to back up a bit, when she was working at the hospital, there was this really mean brother. Um, so the brothers were like workers at the school. They belonged to the church. Um, they weren't priests, but they were workers. And so this um, brother was always picking on her. And when she was working at the hospital, she had to go to the bathroom so bad. Like she could hardly hold it. And every time she went to go, somebody would stop her. Finally, she gets out. She runs to the bathroom. She's just holding it. And he gets down in front of her and he scares her. And she had an accident. Now, most teachers would try and help you like get changed and make sure your classmates didn't find out. Margaret's school, they made her wash her underwear and lay it out to dry on the lawn where everybody else would see it. She wasn't very happy about that. So now she's on the boat, finally going home, um, and she's with her friend and a bunch of other children. The boat stops partway along the way, and the cook says, hey, girls, if you go find some duck eggs, I'll make you some pancakes. So Margaret and Agnes hop off the boat, and they're like, oh, we know we're going to go find some good duck eggs. And they're running around in the bushes, and Margaret said they came across this big white butt, and it was the brother going to the bathroom in the bushes. And so they started laughing, and all the other kids came and they all laughed and it was a little bit of karma. So the boat finally gets to tuck the act She, it's just coming to shore. She doesn't wait for it to fully stop or anything. She just, she sees her mom. She's like, I'm home. She jumps off the boat and she runs for her mom. And her mom looked her up and down and kind of shook her head and said, her mom barely spoke English. She said, not my girl, not my girl. And Margaret was like, what do you, like, what do you mean? Not, not my girl. And her mom didn't recognize her. Margaret was terrified. She thought, oh my God, they're going to send me back to the school. Now, Margaret's mom wasn't a bad person. Margaret went to the school as this chubby, happy eight-year-old with long braids. She came back. She was about as tall as her mom. Um, she was starved right out. She was never fed enough to eat at the school. Her face would have looked very, very traumatized. All her hair was cut off. So her mom didn't recognize her. And Margaret couldn't speak in a Beluktan anymore to tell her mom who she was. And Margaret's mom couldn't speak English. Luckily, Margaret's father recognized her. So he took her in a big hug and Margaret thought, oh, thank God I'm saved. And her mom then joined in and felt really bad. And her brothers and sisters joined in. From there, Margaret had to relearn her language. She had to relearn how to stomach her all her very favorite foods that she hadn't been able to have the whole time she was at the school because she had very bland food at the school. Um, her, her traditional foods, they call them country foods, are very fishy, very salty, very rich. They're very full of flavor and she couldn't stomach that anymore. But Margaret worked really, really hard to relearn um, everything she needed to know and that she missed out on in those two years. Her first year home, she got her own dog sled and team. Just more than getting half a dozen dogs for Christmas, this is getting the keys to the car. You had a lot of freedom if you had your own dog sled and team. And if she was here with us now, she would teach you Hanawit Pit which in her dialect of Inavaluktan means, um, how are you? She was, very she was very proud of being a language keeper. So here's a close up of that picture I showed you earlier of Margaret walking with a foot in both worlds. So after we finished Daddy Legs, Margaret said that what was done at school was really bad, but the worst part was going home 
a stranger where you no longer spoke the language and you couldn't eat the food and you missed out learning all the chores you were supposed to learn and the skills you were supposed to learn. So we worked on a stranger at home. And of course, the, the big thing in a stranger at home is how she does relearn um, to speak her language and all those skills. And um, when I was eight, takes place at the same time as Fatty Legs. It has a few different stories in it, but it's for younger people. Um, same with Not My Girl takes place at the same time as A Stranger at Home, but for younger people. This is a woman who um, kept a secret 65 years and nobody was ever going to find out. And I wasn't allowed to write her story. It was like four books later. Um, we're now at the 10th, actually the 11th anniversary now of Fatty Legs, but um, she did get to see it, make it to its 10th anniversary. There's a um, musical production about her, a music video. Um, she got to travel all over. So here's just um, some of the places that we got to go together. Um, and you might recognize some of these areas uh, from where you live. Um, one of the pictures with the women in button blankets, um, it's my good friend Datsi there. And that was for the very first um, Walk for Reconciliation in Vancouver. There's a picture of Margaret in Havana. She was um, a guest um, in Havana, um, Ottawa. There's her in front of the North Star boat. Um, she went to see Molly's Reach. She was pretty excited about that. So I want you to know, um, this is what Margaret would want you to know, is even as young people, I know that everybody goes through stuff and there are things that you maybe feel very ashamed about. But when you claim your story, you get to be the hero of your own story. And for Margaret, she became famous and got to travel, travel the world when um, she took control of her story. So I'm going to introduce you to Margaret now um, in the only way I really have to share her with you. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions still. My classmate. Oh, we'll have to go back. No, hang on. This one second, I'm having trouble getting it to play. My classmates, they were all excited and they said, guess what, we're getting new stockings. And so uh, the ones I had were always falling down and I was so happy that I was gonna get a new pair. And she handed everyone their stockings. When it came to me, uh, I had my eyes closed and I opened them she had a pair of red stockings in her hands and I looked at her and I said, but, uh, but they're red. And she had that wicked smile on her face. When I went to the, they call it the refectory. It's, it's a, a place where you went to eat your lunch and meals. And uh, they were started, girls started calling me fatty legs and I was, just horrified uh, because one other little girl said she was laughing and she said, ha oh, oh, ha, fatty legs. And I told her fatty face. And then I said, well, come with me and you can't get along with the other children. I got a job for you. So I went to the laundry house and they had a big vat of uh, laundry. And she said, I have to look after that keep the fire going. I was crying and I and um, my t I heard my tear going. I took them off right away and I threw them in with the firewood. And that was that. I was very happy. And then when I got back to the school, uh, the raven said, where are your red stockings? Uh, I burned them, and uh, I got rid of my red stockings. But the, she got the children to find them, to look for them, and I knew they couldn't find them because I know what I did with them. They were gone. I think you could see some of that big personality. Everybody who knew Margaret um, said this beautiful personality. Um, so uh, if you want some teacher resources around studying fatty legs. You can find that at um, cjordanfenton.com. If you want to know more about the Inavaluit, Proud to be Inavaluit by Margaret's brother, James, and the music video, um, Say Your Name. I don't know how I'm going to get out of the um, share screen, but if the producer could take me out of share screen. 
and we'll take some questions. Yeah, for sure. I have some questions uh, for yes. you um, from the students and teachers. Excellent. What was the biggest challenge in writing Fatty Legs? Well, I think for both Margaret and I, it was doing our own healing. Um, Margaret, I was asking Margaret to uh, talk about things that she had kept secret for a long time and she had been left feeling like um, she was wrong. And then for myself, having been raised by somebody who went to residential school, I felt very angry and it was, it was really hard for me to write just from a child's point of view and what it was like. So um, that was hard. Also at that time, there was not any awareness about residential school. So it was a big challenge to try and figure out how we were gonna um, tell people what a residential school was, tell people about Margaret's um, culture she came from. So incidentally, uh, Fatty Lakes uh, first came out the, um, the same month in the same year as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, started their first national event. So that's when Canada decided to let go of the secret uh, about residential schools it was about the same time that Margaret let go of her secret as well. Uh, they're wondering if you're how you're related to Margaret and what encouraged her to bring her story to the public. Right. Um, so how I'm related is Margaret was my mother in law. Um, so I was married to her son. And then when I wasn't married to her son anymore, Margaret said, there's no more in law. So I'm just your mom. Um, so Margaret uh, was my, uh, uh, the customarily adopted uh, mom and also my very, very best friend. And I think there was a second part to that. Did I miss? Yeah, no, and what, what okay. made her go public with it? Oh, yes, what made her go public? Um, I guess it was she said that she, she didn't think anybody cared about her story. She grew up in a time where being Indigenous um, wasn't necessarily a good thing, and she um, married a cowboy, and she said because nobody had asked her before about her stories, and I kept bugging her, and she started to see um, that her stories actually mattered and were important, but a lot of it was just just me constantly harassing her. I actually feel bad for how much I bugged her. And she finally said, um, agreed to letting me write the stories because she said um, that she thought that nobody was gonna care about her story. It was never gonna get published. Even if it did, nobody was ever gonna read it. So she was, she got a big shock. <laughs> um, why did the, the nun, they're asking why the nun gave her red stockings? So in the time of World War II, people didn't wear bright colors and everybody was in uniform. And um, she had had a bit of an altercation with the nun before. The nun was just really had it in for her. So when they, they got new stockings, but they're actually donated stockings. And for some reason, there was a pair of red ones in there, which pretty much like a circus clown would have had red stockings, but nobody else would have worn them. And so the nun... Um, made her wear them like if you've ever seen somebody have to like wear a dunce cap or right. a sign on their back it was like that um, to humiliate her it was done on purpose wow there are so many questions uh, did you use sister mcclellan's name in the book because she was much more kind than the raven yes margaret wanted her to be remembered because she actually was was kind and, and margaret really liked her a lot so that's why she got remembered Okay, and what did she feel about being called Fatty Legs? I think you probably discussed yeah, that. Yeah, she video. did not like that at all. She felt really humiliated. Um, it was bad enough that the nun picked on her, but then when all her peers, like all her classmates joined in, that was, that was too much for her. She wasn't putting up with it for very long. No, um, let's see another one here. Uh, why did Omelan... I, I'm Ole, Uliman. Uliman. Uliman, yeah. Uliman go back to residential school with her sisters? Great question. So she did go back. So um, she skipped school for a year, like Michael Kujagak. <laughs> um, she skipped school for a year. She ran away. She was not going back to the school. Then her father realized her younger sisters were going to have to go to school. They needed to learn to read and write as well. And so he asked Margaret to go back because she was so strong and look after her sisters and help them and be able to translate things for them and tell them what to do so they wouldn't get in trouble. So she went back to protect um, her sisters. That's, a good, that's probably a great way to, to end the session. One last thing, if somebody wanted a signed copy, that was a question uh, of your books, um, how do they do that? Okay, so um, the, 
best thing to do would um, probably just be to contact me. Same with teacher questions, anything like that. Contact me on Facebook because my name is exactly the same, spelled the same as on the cover. And I can either send a sticker plate or um, discuss with how to get a um, book sent to you. I do have um, a Square store. I don't actually remember the link to it right now, but if you went on Square, um, there's a Fatty Lake store. So I could send you, you could order um, a signed copy that way as well. But if you if you message me, I'll send you a sticker plate. For, for and I, and I, can, I can guarantee she's very easy to communicate with. It's wonderful. Uh, I hope it's not 10 years till we see each other again. Yes, I want to thank, thank you. you. Thank you so, so much for being with us today. And I ask the teachers and students to join other sessions uh, for the rest of the day and tomorrow. Um, as well, uh, tonight, there's a national broadcast uh, titled National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It's broadcast uh, on and streamed live on uh, CBC, APTN, and CBC GEM. So that'll be a, a wonderful thing to, to take, uh, take in this afternoon. Wear an orange shirt today, light up your host orange. And, uh, and again, a big, big thank you to you. And, and, uh, and we're thinking of Margaret today as well. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing. Bye-bye. Thank you.